Uh, you should have a handout in front of you, and I, at this time of the season and this time of year, I like to give thanks. Uh, the St. Michael's Episcopal Church Book Club, uh, which I helped found like 20 some years ago, is a group of college professors and retired college professors who get together once a month and their claim to fame uh, is that they invite the actual authors to their book groups. So uh, last night we had a professor at Harper who also teaches at District uh, 211 who has a book out and, and, they, and so they asked me to lead Ruth Bader Ginsburg first, the RBG book. Uh, and I, was, I skipped a meeting, never skip a meeting, because then I got assigned to lead that book. And, <laughs> and it has morphed because they then asked me to lead a book that you'll see uh, in the list here called The Two Sisters of SCOTUS. SCOTUS is the Supreme Court of the United States. So uh, that's the reference I'll be using, so I don't have to say that word every time I, I talk. Uh, but uh, the second sister, the first sister is Sandra Day O'Connor, and the second sister is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So after I did that, uh, they said, hey, now we have two more, you should do four sisters. There is no book out about the four sisters. And I was very intrigued doing the research for this presentation uh, in that uh, I think I may write something about the four of them. Uh, and I uh, like to both speak and write, and, and so hopefully you'll help tell me whether this is really in, in valuable education. I plan on using it besides the extra credit that my student who's here today is, is going to receive um, for attending. I really think that what these four women have to teach us is not just the three P's that I said I was going to discuss about them today, which is their pedigree, their personalities, and their professional development, but they've taught me something else. And that the only way that women can succeed and overcome obstacles, at least in my profession, is a fourth P, and that is persistence. So my, my thought for the day is amb ambition, uh, is the key to success and persistence is the vehicle that you drive in to get that ambition achieved and to get that success. And I am going to be weaving in these people's biographical information into my classes uh, because I see so many of my students that just need to know that if they just finish, if they just per persist, that it, that is, is the key to making it through. It isn't, uh, and, and you will hear that from all four of these women's life stories. So I'm going to go through if, and Kathy, you watch my time. We have to be done before one, right? And I can save time for a couple questions, but I was planning on doing uh, probably the most time on Sandra Day O'Connor, but if you see me uh, and, and the least on, on our newest justice, because there very, is very little written about her yet, Elena Kagan, uh, I'll save room for questions, but I also, I want to do each of them individually with those three characteristics, which is pe their pedigrees, their personalities, and then their professional development, and then I'm going to tell you how I think find them remarkably similar in, and yet dissimilar. And I hope you will uh, agree with me when I'm finished. So I'd like to start with Sandra Day O'Connor. And, and folks, each time I read something about one of these women, I learn something new. Um, she is the only one of the four who's not from New York. The other three women are all from New York. She was it raised on a ranch in Arizona. She. Uh, Went to, uh, I digress, I get into, she went into, she went to Stanford for law school, and one of her law school classmates was Justice Rehnquist, uh, who she ultimately worked with on the Supreme Court when she was approved. He proposed to her first, and she did not marry him. She married her other classmate, her name was Sandra Day, and she married O'Connor. But then she went on to work with him, which I find fascinating and one of the most important jobs there is. Um, as you might note under A of my handout, she served alone on the Supreme Court for 15 years before Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, showed up. And they call her FWOTSC, first woman, woman on the Supreme Court. And she called herself that. She had t-shirts that said that. Um, she uh, did set up an exercise program for female clerks. So she, that was her way of trying to help established some camaraderie there at the Supreme Court. Interestingly enough, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg came, she wouldn't exercise with her. Um, and they're, they're very different. Um, one is very conservative, and one is perceived as being on the liberal end of the spectrum. But now, since everyone wants Ruth Bader Ginsburg to continue to stay 
in, uh, in office and not leave that spot open for another uh, conservative appointment to the bench, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg at age 84 started exercising. And, but but her, her compatriot was already gone, uh, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. They do talk about in the book Two Sisters, which I highly recommend. It's a great read. It, and I'm sure if one of our English uh, professors was here, they could tell me what the writing technique is, where you one chapter is on one woman, then it goes to the other woman, then it goes back and forth. And it kind of parallels their lives. Um, it's very interesting. Sandra Day O'Connor had three sons. She was sixth in her class at Stanford. Um, she too, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, could not find a job as a lawyer when she finished. There were, women just weren't hired. There was the, that sort of glass ceiling and discrimination in their generation. Uh, and so she started out as a secretary, then became a district attorney. Her husband ended up getting, who was also a lawyer, that's another common theme with these women. Three of them are married to other lawyers, um, as, as am I. Uh, she followed her husband in the army to Germany, got a job there, which she was a civil attorney helping out over there, but it was a low-level job. Then came back, became an assistant attorney general in Arizona, ran for the Arizona Senate, became its first ever majority leader. Another common theme, these women are groundbreakers. Then she became a judge, then she became an appeals judge, and she uh, replaced someone named Potter Stewart on the Supreme Court. Uh, she did receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom and was replaced by uh, Justice Alito. Um, that is pretty much her background educationally and her pedigree. In terms of her personality, she's friendly, but she was not friends with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Like I said, they didn't exercise together. They, they, they conjoined together when they needed to, but they were not you know, uh, big social chums. She stayed home for a bit of her career. She is very devoted to her husband, who, and that is why she retired from the bench. You see, many of our justices are trying to hang in there to their late 80s. She retired, and her husband was, has been very ill. What she's done in her free time is start classroom civics across the country. She got $5 million in grants raised, and she's trying to teach elementary schools about the Supreme Court. She's not a limelight person, folks, and the fact that you would even see on the news that she now announced in the last month that she herself has Alzheimer's, dementia, and is stepping back from the public life, she never really was out there in the first place. She was, to me, she's understated grace about her, her who she is, what she achieved for all women attorneys and judges. Um, she has written a book with her brother called Lazy Bee, and she's also written two children's books called Chico and Fleming. She's considered open-faced, cheerful, and um, a bit, I mean, when you see pictures of her, and we see pictures of all of them, you think they're very dignified. And they are, if you've ever met them or seen them speak. She wore more of an old-fashioned England English lace uh, collar, and I apologize. I actually have the collars that I, for all four of these, and I didn't get back to my office to get them. Uh, hers was more what you think of somebody in uh, old England was wearing. But she's known in her book to have dropped trow in a clerk's driveway to go to the bathroom in the bushes. And uh, while still belonging to an elite country club, she wants, wanted no special treatment. And in fact, there wasn't even a woman's bathroom for her during those 15 years at the Supreme Court. They didn't get one until Ruth Bader Ginsburg came. And I can tell you folks, being in the third class of women that were allowed into Notre Dame's law school, we didn't have a woman's bathroom. And when it's really cold outside, to go to another building or to have to do what you might have seen in Hidden Figures, that woman running down the street, it's not easy to be somewhere for 15 years without your own bathroom. So, uh, and like I said, she didn't run around yelling for one until there was two of them. And then they got a bathroom. Uh, in terms of her professional cases, uh, she tended to be a fourth or fifth vote. She tended to be, I mean, even though she comes from Arizona, she was nominated by a Republican president, Ronald Reagan. She was someone that people thought uh, was uh, going to be really conservative. And she tended to be more in the middle than, than you would imagine. Uh, more moderate than conservative, and on on the decisions that came out, she was she was someone who was a, sometimes then a swing vote, and would make it go one way or the other. She might side with Justice Thomas, who was considered ultra conservative, and I followed him. He was the one who was at the EEOC and had the Anita Hill case. Um, 
he is ultra conservative, and she uh, wouldn't, even if she ended up voting with him, she would not let him write the opinion. She would write her own opinion so that everyone understood what she thought as opposed to what he thought if they happened to agree on an issue. She was known for meticulous research and writing. She's not known for her oral skills, so that was her, so that was her uh, baby is the research that she would do. Um, she thought the First Amendment cases should be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and that to me is really thoughtful analysis instead of just going one way all the time on a, on a rule. Uh, she had a case that uh, she wrote an opinion on about, a, a, she said it's okay to publicly display a nativity, un, and she thought the, it survived an, it, an undue burden analysis under the 14th Amendment with due process. Interesting for these women when they get women's issues, she, one of the first abortion cases is Roe v. Wade, and it, had, um, it came out before she got there, but the first time an abortion case came to the Supreme Court after she was there, she got about 60,000 letters from women across the country. She didn't mention Roe v. Wade, and, and she wrote, tended to write her own opinions about what she thought based on the law, and as you know, it's a federal right for a woman to have an abortion during the first trimester. And then the Constitution uh, interpretation is that um, in the second and third trimester, there are other states have regulations. And what people who are my students learn is that Illinois, if there wasn't a federal law, Illinois is actually a pro-life state if it was sent back to state law here in Illinois. And we haven't managed to have a constitutional convention to amend our constitution on any topic, including balancing the budget, paying teachers pensions, or um, pro-life issues. But that, um, so what tends to happen with the justices, since the four female justices have taken the bench, since Roe v. Wade was already the law, is uh, it, was, it became the law in the 70s. Um, and as you know, she didn't take the bench till way after that, uh, is that there are regulations. And one of the ones that she didn't care for at all, she didn't think that any woman should have to notify their husband. So that was one of the ones that like, people are like, well, she's a Republican, she'll be pro-life. She looks at the regulations in her, from her own uh, analytical perspective and her own research. She defected from the conservative majority in a case called Webster versus Reproductive Health Services. Um, it said, uh, it, and, but lowered regulations in the Casey case, and like I said, she uh, would use a constitutional muster test and an undue burden test. And again, her her own uh, vantage point is you shouldn't have to talk to your spouse about it. It's it's, it's in the, she thought of, of it as an individual woman's right. Uh, another case that she had, and, and I'm not making this really case heavy for those of you who are not in my law business law class or or lawyers, but. Uh, Price Waterhouse case for folks like me who are employment lawyers is the one where they talked a lot about what is evidence that you need in a sexual harassment case. And she uh, wrote a, some really interesting opinions in that. And when there were when there was a justice that might say something that sounded sort of like discriminatory to her as a woman, she wrote Brennan, who was one of the justices at the time, a five-page individual letter about how to how to interpret sexual harassment in the workplace in terms of women. Um, I thought that was that was that to me is just her style. That is, she's not um, combative. Uh, in that she, she knew she had to work with these people and she knew she had to get along and she knew she was alone up there. So um, uh, she also had an election case and she opposed redistricting in these election cases when she realized the only reason the redistricting was going on was to discriminate against people on the basis of race. So while people might say, well, she's conservative, in my opinion, those cases show that she was more of a moderate or even when she thought something was right or wrong, she'd come out and, and use her analysis and her reasoning and her research to make those decisions work. Um, I'll leave you with her with two quotes that I, or lo three quotes that I loved. And one, I, I, I think it's gonna become one of my mottos. The power I exert on the court depends on the power of my arguments, not my gender. She also said, we've long made it clear that a state of war is not a blank check for a president when it comes uh, to the rights of the nation's citizens. And then this one is for my students. Do the best you can in every task, no matter how unimportant it may seem at the time. No one learns more about a problem than the person who's at the very bottom. And uh, uh, I guess you can see that I, not only do I have the admiration that I do for her because she was our first, but I have a lot of admiration for her personal uh, stamp on things and her style. It's not to say that any of these other women's styles that I'm gonna tell you about um, are, it fits everybody's personality, and that's why 
um, the topics pedigree, personality, and then their professional development are important. On to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who actually in your handout has on the, her collar, so you can see it. And there is now a bug for anyone who's a science professor here at um, MCC named after the, the collar that she wears. It's got her, it's like, it's, it's got a longer name than like uh, Ginsburg Jabotorium or something like that, but there's a, a bug with, uh, and, it, and it's a bug that looks lacy when it's um, hiding itself. But I told you that um, in terms of the second sisters, that the first one was the only one who didn't live in New York. So you now know that everybody I'm gonna talk about after this lives in New York. Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, it was born in New York. There is, at this holiday season, um, um, the second movie's coming out, which Felicity Jones, who was just in Star Wars and is um, a recognized Oscar-winning actress, and who's actually British, is starring as her. And it is called On the Basis of Sex, and it's about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's sexual harassment cases, legacies. Um, and there's also another movie that um, is a documentary that you can get on Netflix right now. And there's also a book that were written by, it was written by one of her law clerks and also um, someone from CNN or NBC wrote it with her. Uh, she's currently serving, despite having fallen last year and broken at three ribs and everybody who was worried she was leaving the bench, but she's back at it. She joined in 1996. So that's like 20 years after Roe v. Wade and 15 years after Sandra Day O'Connor. And that's when SCOTUS added the women's bathroom. Uh, she was appointed by Bill Clinton. She had two children. And her granddaughter also worked with her, uh, went to Harvard Law School and got to clerk with her, which I think is incredible for those of you who are grandmothers in the room, to have that opportunity to show your granddaughter um, just kind of like what your work ethic is and, and uh, the ways that she worked. She had a sister named Marilyn who died at age six who called her Kiki. So when you see things that refer to her as Kiki, uh, that's from her sister. She had a brother that she said her parents favored more than her, and he went on to be a doctor, but she sure has, uh, if her parents were living, she sure has passed him up. Her friends called her Joan, uh, because that's her first name, and her middle name is actually Ruth. Um, I thought that was interesting. She is a dynamo. She, uh, as I said, um, met her husband Marty at 19, uh, they got married. That He got cancer while they were both in law school and uh, uh, she went and begged his classmates to take really good notes and she helped him pass and he became a tax lawyer. But that's why she ended up going both to Columbia Law School where she was and, and also Harvard Law School and she started at Harvard, was number one in her class, and when the students at Columbia saw that she was admitted, they're like, she's gonna come out number one here and knock, knock off all the rest of us who were here first year and had achieved our order and everything because she's just very bright. Um, she uh, went to uh, Cornell for undergrad. She is our first Supreme Court justice who's had a parent die when she was very young. Um, and her parents, uh, and she's also one of the three, besides having one, one of the three that had a parent die when she was very young, uh, also had parent, a dad who was a lawyer, and her parents were politically active in New York. Um, her majority opinions are listed here, and unlike the stylish and graceful way that Sandra J. O'Connor operated, Ruth Bader Ginsburg didn't write private letters to other judges. She'd write powerful, long dissents and tell them exactly why her reasoning didn't work uh, the way theirs did. Folks, of all four of the Supreme Court justices, there is a bobblehead for her. There are socks for her. There are t-shirts. There is uh, there's an exercise video showing you of the exercises she does now to stay on the Supreme Court. She has gone commercial. That would be very different from Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, uh, she was on the, Jimmy Carter first appointed her to the U.S. Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia, but she too had an experience that many of us who are women attorneys have. She was demoted while she was working pregnant with her first job. She too also had followed her husband to the state of Oklahoma where he was in the uh, Army and doing JAG Corps lawyer work, and she worked for the Social Security Administration, and she was not being paid the same as a man and, um, and was not able to get work easily. Uh, Justice Felix Frankfurter, which who may not mean much, he's long dead and not on the Supreme Court, he refused to take her as a clerk and said it was based on her being a woman. This made her professors at Columbia angry. So they threatened 
and they said, they threatened and they wrote a letter to Justice Palmieri and said, we're never gonna send you any more clerks from Columbia Law School in New York if you don't take the girl, who's, woman who's number one in our class, who is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So that will tell you how she got in. She uh, went and off and wrote about civil procedure in Sweden. She was known as being only one of 20 women law professors in all of the United States. She co-founded a periodical called the Women's Rights Law Reporter and also wrote a book on sex discrimination. So you can already see by all of that professional development how you know, her predecessor, Sandra Day O'Connor, has kind of had to tiptoe around the issues, write private letters. She was just out there blasting them. She argued in front of the Supreme Court before she got on the Supreme Court, and that's unlike many of the other women we're going to talk about. Uh, she went to the American Civil Liberties Union, and uh, she um, actually she handed. I love one that she handled several of her first um, women's cases. Uh, she stuck up for a spouse of a woman in the military, a man who was getting discriminated against. So she. You know, her idea of sticking up for people in terms of discrimination is even-handed, uh, men and women. She, in, in uh, the case in Missouri, she, she uh, wrote and argued on behalf of women having the right to be, get jury duty, folks. And I know for many of us, it seems like this right to vote has been around most of our growing up years. We all serve as jurors. We all can get driver's licenses. But believe you, me, in the generation before me, I'm 56, the women in their 70s and 80s had to still fight for that for all of us. Um, uh, she also, um, so Weinberger versus Weisenfeld is the widower and the man who was, who was denied his spouse's benefits. Um, uh, Rehnquist, as you know, who used to date Sandra Day O'Connor from my little tidbit in the earlier one, asked her if she wouldn't just stop arguing these cases in front of the Supreme Court and just settle for the fact that they put Susan B. Anthony on a dollar. And, and she said no, she wasn't going to settle for that in open court. So that's one of her uh, in, in, in court quotes. Um, when she was uh, nominated to the Supreme Court, she took an interesting approach which was brought up again with this Brett Kavanaugh sequence that we just had. She was asked about the death penalty and said she wouldn't give her answers about the death penalty. And they now call it pulling a Ginsburg. She said, I may have to do a death penalty case and I don't want you using either side using that against me to get me recused or so I'm not going to tell you what my personal opinions are on that. And that to me was unusual because our justices are really probed heavily about how do they feel about personal things as well as professional things, even though as judges under their ethical canons, they're supposed to say that they'll rule on the cases as the facts are in front of them, not based on their personal bias. Um, she is known for being the second Jew ever on the U.S. Supreme Court and the first woman who was a Jew. She answered she believed in a right to privacy and gender equality. Um, Hatch, who's actually a Republican, proposed her. That's how well regarded she was in terms of being a very bright woman and, and the credibility of what she was doing. Um, so they call it the Ginsburg precedent in, under B here in my handout for nominees not to answer all the questions and just answer things about what they've done in their previous decisions. In terms of abortion rights, she was criticized that instead of building a, she is, she's come out and said that instead of building a right, there just seems to be a series of court cases on regulations. And in fact, she's right. There isn't something that talks about women's rights so much as just kind of like, well, we'll let you do this, but we won't let you do that. And again, I think it's because of that underlying tension that the states have their own laws on it. And, uh, and, and I don't know that we've really, she, she thinks we haven't really reconciled the whole area. So to the extent that people clip and misquote her on Roe v. Wade, she's not opposed to Roe v. Wade or she's not opposed to these cases. She's just saying nobody's ever really gotten into where's the right in the Constitution and, and what does that right mean? People just kind of like answer yes or no on regulations. Um, I loved her case on gender. Uh, it's VMI under 3D is the Virginia Military Academy, Academy and Institute. They wouldn't admit women. And so she, um, and in Ledbetter versus Goodyear, um, she handled a case where women didn't know they were being paid less. There was also a 13-year-old who was uh, strip searched at a school called Safford School. And in that case, she came out and said to one of the other male justices, uh, it wasn't like a strip search, like take all your clothes off. It was like something with the student's bra. And she told one of the, hello, she told one of the other justices, 
None of you wear bras, so you have no idea what it feels like to have this kind of invasion. So she just calls it a spade, a spade, and as you see it, and that was said in open court. Um, she criticized Colin Kaepernick as being really dumb and then apologized to that. Um, she went to Egypt. She wrote a book called In Her Own Words, so she has her own biography. Uh, during the Me Too movement, she has come out and talked more about it than anybody else. She talked about being asked, which is a quid pro quo harassment at Cornell. A professor asked her if she wanted the chemistry answers if she would sleep with him. And so she's talked about that now. Um, Marty, her husband, who survived his cancer early in their career, cooked for the court. And when I showed up to do this presentation in, in Barrington at the book club, a lady got Marty's cookbook, checked it out from the library, and cooked what Marty cooked for the Supreme Court without telling me. I walked in, I was so touched. I was like, wow. I mean, he, and, and so he would cook for her and all the clerks given the long hours they were working, which again, it, that's a way of saying something without, without having to say it. But the, her husband, Marty, was like, I'm a tax lawyer. You're busy on the Supreme Court. I'm going to bring food in for everybody while you're working late, and I'm going to do the cooking. Um, in her 80s, she has, she has wandered across the, she mentioned, as I think you all know, that she thought she might, if a certain person was elected president, uh, move to Canada. And that's something that we're, justices are not supposed to, as she knows, say anything about how they vote or who they like or don't like. And she's apologized for that. She has survived colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and again, the Jabot necklace has a bu bug name for her. So that is our second uh, justice. Third justice is Sonia Sotomayor. She has a book out which I recommend reading if you want to know about her biography. It's called My Beloved World. Uh, she is the third sister of SCOTUS. She, her pedigree is she's Puerto Rican and, of course, from the Bronx in New York. Um, she's our first Latina on the Supreme Court. Uh, she was diagnosed six, at six years old with diabetes and had to learn to inject herself. She had a pretty horrible childhood like Ruth's. Her parents divorced, her single mom was a nurse, her dad died of alcoholism when she was nine. And I think that that helped to drive her to her successfulness. For my students in the classroom, you need to know that she got a C in American history and she's on the Supreme Court. Her uh, inspiring author is Alice in Wonderland. At Yale Law School, she was the first woman of Latina Puerto Rican ancestry. She married her high school sweetheart, uh, their wedding was in the, when she, while she was serving in the Second Circuit. They got divorced and when they were in Chicago. And she ended up almost dying in a hospital in Venice when her diabetes got out of control as an adult. Um, she uh, she said, had a statement and a quote in 2001 that a wise Latina woman is better than a white man. And, and, uh, and she kind of had to backtrack from that and said that was sort of rhetorical. Um, but uh, her professional career involves being an assistant district attorney in New York for four and a half years and then working for the Puerto Rican Defense Fund and then for working in mortgage and campaign finance. George Bush nominated her to the United States District Court where she served as a federal judge. Then Bill Clinton put her on the Second Circuit. She is our most prolific writer uh, before she made it to the Supreme Court. She'd already written 3,000 cases 380 opinions while teaching at NYU and Columbia's law school at night. So this is someone that I look at when I think about complaining about my working all day and coming to teach here at MCC that she's a powerhouse. Um, she was con confirmed by 6831 liberal voting bloc along ideological lines. She believes in the rights of defendants and oftentimes calls for reform in criminal justice. She too writes dissents based on race, gender, and ethnic reasons. Her brother was a doctor. She was raised Catholic as a Yankee fan. And the books that inspired her were Nancy Drew. And I can, I can say I was also inspired by Nancy Drew's books. She worked for one year at one of the big law firms, and they fired her. And she said she learned a lot from that mistake. And so I tell my, the young people that I mentor that, you know what? You can get fired and look where you can end up. Um, she complained against another firm that hired her, Shaw Pittman, and, um, because some partner there said that she was only hired for affirmative action. Um, Personality-wise, she's described as a smart, hardworking, talented prosecutor. She prevented Major League Baseball from unionizing. Uh, so you can see that even though she's considered on the liberal side, um, she, you know, she looks at what the law says and reasons her way through it. Um, she also, her famous cases is she had a Wall Street Journal um, 
First Amendment case and thought the public should see Vince Foster, that was a friend and partner of Hillary Clinton's who committed suicide, should be able to see his suicide note and that newspaper should have to re reveal it. She had the Seinfeld copyright case and it took her one year to get confirmed um, due to something called the secret hold that was going on where they were trying to not put judges into office um, to make sure that they could wait and get someone that was from a certain political party. But again, Orrin Hatch and 22 Republicans got her on. So even though she's perceived to be from uh, the more liberal side of the bench, she's actually considered a centrist. Um, she has had 150 business cases and those of the, us who are in the legal profession think she's somewhat inconsistent. And that's, that's, people say, well, you can't count on her to rule for your company or your client or whatever. But I think that she is very consistent, as is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, with reading the facts, providing the correct analysis, and keeping their own personal bias out of the cases, which throws people. Um, she's got her decisions to override other political bodies, have the same percentages as other judges. And she thinks, she thought the questions that were asked by the men in Congress at the time of her confirmation were stereotypical to her ethnicity. Uh, in terms of abortion, uh, she dealt with um, the cases about whether NGOs uh, had got financing to provide abortions. Um, she said uh, the First Amendment allowed a New York employee to send out racist materials under the First Amendment on his own time. Uh, and then there's a few cases of uh, Miranda Wright's, some, and uh, she also said that the Affordable Care Act, which she, I think, philosophically is in favor of, didn't address the car insurance argument, and I put that in there for my students in my class because we, you know what the car insurance argument is about, like, uh, that we started with our very first dis discussion forum when we talk about Obamacare, like, people say that, can I be forced to have insurance? And we say we already force people in every state to have car insurance, so why not health insurance? Uh, she had, um, she dissented in the Wheaton College and Hobby Lobby case and all three women of the Supreme Court on that one dissented together. And that's about whether contraceptives should be provided by companies that are conservative. Um, in her public life, she's very active with the University of, of Puerto Rico and helping people from Puerto Rico and other groups. And Bryn Mawr has given her the Katherine Hepburn Award. Finally, in our last of the four sisters, Elena Kagan in 2010. Again, you know what I'm gonna tell you, she's from New York, uh, Upper West Side. She has from, uh, has a, ha, always had a menorah growing up. She's Ukrainian and Polish. Uh, went to Hunter College in high school. She's from, she went to Princeton and then went to Oxford where she did two years at Worcestershire College writing a 125 page thesis. She says she doesn't like Hamilton's federalism. Uh, she clerked for Mikva, went to Harvard, usually sticks up for the rights of kids, criminal rights, blind people, and busing. She is the youngest. She is also single. She did not come through the courts, folks, or the Ivy League schools. She worked here at the University of Chicago. She got to meet Barack Obama when she was down there. They were both professors together, and then he and, and they became friends. She worked at, she hired Kavanaugh to teach at Harvard. Um, she did work at the Williams and Connolly Law Firm for a short period of time, and she was named our first female Solicitor General. Again, her father was an attorney. Edi she was the editor of Harvard Law Review and also its first female dean. She actually worked on confirming Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg was only confirmed out of the committee that she worked on, 13 to 6. Um, her professional cases are obscenity. She was special counsel to Biden and the White House and a domestic policy advisor. She loves Chicago and the White Sox as opposed to the Yankees. Um, she had six publications at the University of Chicago. She was told to recuse herself during the Obamacare hearings because of the previous work she did. She has a famous case ruling on a patent case that we studied in my class about Spider-Man. And there are a few other cases there. In terms of her personality, she's nicknamed Shorty by Thur Thurgood Marshall for whom she clerked. She has a reputation for reaching out to conservatives across the aisle. She replaced Justice John Paul Stevens, who's a uh, justice I did a paper on, and she's passionately advocating for gay rights. There are no major biographical works from her. So if you want to turn to the last two pages, and then we'll have time for questions, um, I'm going to skip to the bottom. I and Kathy can actually email all of you if you're interested in any of these, but to prepare my uh, first talk, I did 
I read the book, Sisters in Law, How, Ru How Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg went to the Supreme Court and changed the world. Excellent book. Highly recommend it to everybody. It's, even if you're not a lover of biographies, it's really fascinating. And it's where some of those little vignettes I had are from. These are the books about Sandra Day O'Connor, which you would think the list would be longer because she's been around the most. And of these, uh, most of these she's chosen to write, uh, which is interesting, which is another way of keeping your privacy. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has Notorious, my own words, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, A Life, I Dissent, The Unstoppable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, The Legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, You Cannot Spell Truth Without Ruth in It, No Truth Without Ruth. Um, there are many children's books uh, about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I, I didn't even list them all. Uh, Elena Kagan, The Oath, her biography, her time on the Supreme Court. She's also buried in a book about Jewish justices of the Supreme Court. I mean, the books on her, you have to go read other books that have all of them in it to get information on her because she's the newest. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor, which is the last one on here, she has the beloved world of Sonia Sotomayor and turning pages, and then the rest of them are, are children's books or she actually has a book in Spanish for children about herself, which I thought was pretty cool too. But um, the, on, the, the, one that, the only one you can read is The Beloved World, really. And with that particular book, she won't write anything about what happened once she started onto the Supreme Court. So it's truly, she's going to keep all those papers private until she's done, which is another interesting approach. Um, that's where my research is from. And Kathy has got an email from me that has all the um, publication dates and, and uh, where you can find them and what libraries have them and all that. Uh, but I'd like to conclude with what I think, and, you, and you've heard me saying it throughout their approaching each of them individually. Their similarities that they all had really hard lives. And I know my students at MCC tell me about their what's going on in their lives. And I've heard some of the hardest stories I've ever had to hear in my 16 years teaching here about folks. And and what I think is great is that most of, three of these had their one parent die in childhood. So they're so I don't know if that either um, um, propelled them to think, I got to make it, I got to make it. My mom's trying so hard and my dad's trying so hard, so I just got to do this. Um, they also talk about early discrimination. Uh, the three that are married had spouses that were lawyers, and initially they'd follow them, experience more discrimination, and have to try to find another way through the system. Um, I've told you that many of them have been fired along the way or spoken to in ways that you wouldn't want to be spoken to or see a student of yours spoken to. Um, they, what, is all, what I think is also similar about them is they're all brown haired and they're all petite. So this is not, I guess that means I'm out for the Supreme Court. But um, they also um, have incredible academic success once they found what they liked, not necessarily all the way through, which is what I want my students to know. Who cares if you got a C in American history is what, or you got a, a, a C in tax law or whatever. That's the point for our students here at MCC. Uh, they also showed a lot of camaraderie with women along their way in the form of providing food or exercise. But um, they, they show you that they're also interconnected in legal circles, which I want my students to understand here in, at MCC is we are a network when we're in a class of 24 or 25 of us. Three are from New York. And they're also all groundbreakers. Um, their differences are some of them are better writers. Some of them, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was truly the oral advocate um, of, of all of them. Uh, some have had cases with women's issues. Some have had opportunities to be consensus builders. Um, the last justice doesn't have a lot of, she has more academic background, which most of our Supreme Court justices actually practice law. And they kind of hold that out as you have to have actually argued in court if you're going to understand how the people in, who are coming in front of you feel. And so Kagan doesn't have that. She was a ac true academic. Um, she was a dean. Uh, and she never argued in front of the Supreme Court. The other ones had. So um, uh, reading these books, I hope, for our students, and, and if you have a chance to recommend it to anybody, will teach you a lot about persistence. And I think that. Uh, I think that we'll see on a going forward basis, you don't have to be from New York, but, um, but you, wherever you are, you should establish a network, you should um, work hard at academic success, you should, uh, and you should just realize that there are a lot, there are a lot of things that, uh, to overcome in life and, and that it is a persistence. It's persistence more than their pedigrees, their husbands, their uh, whatever. When somebody can write 3,000 cases, that's a lot to write 
or 380 opinions. I mean, they, they work a lot of long hours, and so that's my other message to the students at MCC. Any questions about any of them? I have a question in general. Sure. And this is just, I guess, your personal opinion. Do you ever think that there will be a majority of women on the Supreme Court? In our lifetime? Not in my lifetime. I'll tell you, folks, uh, and I'm finally getting age in perspective with all these gray hairs. I don't know if it's wisdom, but Iowa just elected in November their first female Supreme Court justice. And the case of, there's a case of sexual harassment that I teach in my class about the beautiful dental assistant. It's this week's assignment. Um, they had an all male. Uh, an all-male panel. I mean, are there parts of the United States that we haven't made it through? I mean, I look at, uh, it'll be a while, but I will say that, like college, uh, we're over 50% in the law schools now. And in some law schools, there's still, Notre Dame is not, I mean, there's still, um, they're not, but, uh, uh, it, you know, I hope that, uh, I hope that, that because of these kind of women, that the treatment that people get is better. Um, you know, so, um, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. I mean, yeah. well, I, wrote, I, I mean, I've been going around this week speaking to the bar associations at the request of Ann Burke, who is 74 years old and is on the rotation to be uh, the chief of the Illinois Supreme Court. And she's not our first, Marianne McMorrow was our first, I believe. But, and there's only, there's three women up in Illinois, as opposed to zero in Iowa. But, um, and, the, and they do to, together agree on things, even though they come from very different political backgrounds or whatever. And so I wrote her a letter in January, Pete knows this story, and I said, okay, I sent this report, a 53-page report that I wrote as a young lawyer at night about sexual harassment and misconduct um, to the Supreme Court. It took them 25 years to pass a rule. It wasn't until 2016 when Rita Garman was our Chief Justice that we got an anti-harassment rule for lawyers. And uh, what was startling to me is how fast those 25 years went, raising two kids, working, whatever. But uh, what I was also sad is that everybody else on the committee pretty much has passed away. So I'm like the youngest still, living, still alive member. And so she's like, Mary, I need you to go around and we need to talk about that rule and we need to get people understanding that in the meantime, she's working on trying to come up with training for lawyers and judges. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, uh, in September, uh, 1993 Loyola Law grad, who my brother was in his class, said in open court about a female prosecutor down at Cook County, he said, oh, she won't smile at me. I think she's a bitch. I think I slept with her in law school. And he said it in open court. And so Justice Tim Evans immediately removed him and ordered all of our justices to um, 30 days, in, in 30 days, complete sexual harassment training, which is back to, we, you and, right. we've all been talking about that. And, uh, and now DuPage County, so that, that Judge Evans has had them do that 10 question on a computer training, which, Anyway, you know what I think about that. So DuPage, who just had a judge who got in trouble for something similar, his name was Patrick O'Shea. I'm helping draft their interactive training. They're going to do it the right way, you know, so people really understand it. Um, so uh, it, is change long coming? Yes. Will it survive my lifetime? Uh, Happen in my lifetime? I don't know. But uh, we have to keep knocking. So any other questions? Did you see how this tied into class a little bit? Yes. Good, good. Anybody else? They're fabulous women. Great curl up in the winter biographical reads. And Kathy will get you, Kathy will get you all the publication dates and everything. So in your class there is a focus on the Supreme Court? Uh, I try to use cases from the Supreme Court and uh, I offer my students an opportunity to come to court with me. Uh, for extra credit so they can see what it's like if they have an interest in the law. And then I offer them an opportunity to write either a personal legal experience, but some people aren't comfortable if they want to, don't want to write about their traffic ticket or whatever. Um, but I, I, I get, I'm adding this as a component if they want to read one of these books and write a, uh, an extra credit paper. I just think that they would get a message from this and they would get invigorated about where they are and get, how to get out of where they are, you know, and get on. 
Can't wait to see um, other groundbreaking women join the Supreme Court. Uh, we have Clarence Thomas, uh, but we still don't have a female African American uh, justice. Um, we don't have, uh, there's lots of other uh, ethnic and uh, geographical areas to get on all those courts. Um, how, do you have any idea like how many of the clerks who clerk for the Supreme Court justices are female? The number isn't as high as you would think, and I thought it was really interesting that Brett Kavanaugh was telling everyone, well, I'm going to have all four of mine are going to be women. Yeah. That was his, his thing. What I will let you know about the whole environment is that uh, last December, Justice Roberts, who's our chief, got a letter from 700 of the female clerks across the country saying, okay, you took two justices out for sexually harassing us, but when are you going to train the rest of them? And so the Supreme Court and the federal court is also working on sexual harassment training for the judges. And, and the stories are horrendous. I mean, there's this judge in Ray Gregg in Michigan who, you know, is naked in his, in, in his office and all the rest of this. And then this, there's a guy named uh, Abraham Watkins in, in Iowa and Van Buren County who, He's arguing he's also the county attorney and he got elected and that only the electoral population can remove him. And so we really have to s straighten out our ethics rules um, when we see people engaging in this kind of conduct. Um, the rule I was talking about that went into effect here two years ago that I worked on, 25 years ago, has had nine cases prosecuted on it in a year and a half to conclusion. One of them is In re Paul Weiss, fellow uh, who was a class action lawyer. In the cases 25 years ago said, the defense, defendants would say, you don't have a rule on sexually harassing people, so you can't get me, basically. This guy is arguing, I'm a great lawyer. I'm a great class action lawyer. I make a lot of money. So the fact that I was sitting at the Deerfield train station with nothing on under my bathrobe, or coming down and getting my mail with nothing on under my bathrobe, or had four women in my office complain that I tied them up, sexually harassed them, assaulted them, telephone harassed them. He said, that's all my private life. And it doesn't have anything to do with me being a great lawyer. That's the new, that's the, the new defense. And so what I think Justice Burke and others are saying, Mary, go out and remind people that we are officers of the court. We are held to a higher standard. We're supposed to be role models. We're not supposed to be uh, engaging in this kind of behavior. So um, that, that's, where I, that's still where the law needs to come. And then I think we have cultural things that need to come too. But uh, no, thank you for the opportunity to be here at MCC with all of you. This was, you can tell I loved reading all these books. So I hope you all enjoy them too.